all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Jim Fosson. Welcome. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fosson. I'm the officer of the deck today. My uh, partner, Dale Throneberry, is in sick call. They're probably going to give him a couple of aspirin, pat him on the back, and say, get back and report to duty. But uh, we all know how that goes. You, uh, so he'll be back certainly next week. And maybe I'll even get him to squeak in a little bit with his bad voice here today. But uh, we're glad to have our friends from the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System, Brian Hayes, with us and uh, retired uh, Brigadier General Carol Ann Fossone to answer some questions about uh, disability issues and what's going on at the VA. we got something special, hopefully, to talk about there. But before we really get started, we always want to thank our sponsors. We can't do this, and we're entering our 20th year here on Veterans Radio, and we can't do this without sponsors like the National Veterans Business Development Council, who you can find at nvbdc.org. NVBDC is the nation's premier certifier, third-party certifier of veteran-owned businesses, which is important for veteran businesses so that they can get work, not only with the government sector, but the large private sectors. Uh, Companies also want that certification to know that they're dealing with a truly veteran-owned business. Uh, NVBDC has been a longtime sponsor, and we're glad to have them as as partners in this in this program with us here on Veterans Radio. Similarly, Legal Help for Veterans, a veterans disability law firm handling uh, claims nationwide, has been a supporter of Veterans Radio for a long time. And you can find them at LegalHelpForVeterans.com on the web or 800-693-4800. So as we get started into this, I think it's uh, one of the things I wanted to point out as we get into this next segment is over the years, uh, certainly the years that many of us served, uh, the number of women involved in the military continues to grow, uh, grows at a higher rate than uh, the growth of any, pretty much any other subgroup in the military on the recruiting side. And currently there are about 17% of the active duty force is women and roughly 21% of the National Guard and Reserves force is women. And that actually puts the United States in a really good spot as it relates to, if you look at numbers from the NATO countries, the only other NATO country that has a higher percentage of women involved in the military uh, uh, happens to be Hungary of all places. Um so it's really, uh, you know, women have always served in the military, and they certainly are serving at a high uh, percentage rate today. And if you read any of the recruiting problems that you see the Army and other services having, they're really focusing on women as a demographic that they need to be recruiting for. Uh, so that really begs the question, uh, we're going to have more women veterans, and we have to make sure that we're taking care of them. Um and that brings us to what the VA is doing in this area. And we're glad to have Brian Hayes on from, from the Charles S. Kettles uh, VA Center. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit uh, about what the VA is thinking about as it relates to more and more women veterans. Well, VA, uh, Cheryl will be able to talk about this in a minute too. VA is really just retooling things and rethinking about how we serve our women veterans for uh, for our health care system specifically. We're about 10% women veterans that are coming to us. And that's going up by about a percentage a year or a little slightly less than a percentage a year. So it's increasing uh, pretty quickly. And uh, and that means that we have to rethink how we provide health care to all of our veterans. Um, there are different ways of doing it depending on your gender and, uh, you know, getting away from that attitude of the last hundred years or so that the VA is a man's hospital. And it's it's certainly not. It's a, it's a health care system for everyone. Um, I don't know if you wanted to bring on Cheryl or not, but she could certainly talk about uh, all the, you know, intricate details about what we're doing for women veterans. We'd, we'd love to connect uh, Cheryl Allen, who is the uh, uh, Women's Veterans Program Coordinator for the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System. I've uh, show that she's joining, but I don't have her, I don't think. Uh, do I have you there, Cheryl? I'm on the phone. 
I can't perfect. get into Zoom, but I am here. Ah, oh, perfect. We're, we're glad to have you and, and bring some of your expertise to this conversation. As, as you've heard, we're sort of recognizing that we have a lot more women in the military active and reserve, and that means we're going to have a lot more women veterans as time goes on. So tell us a little bit about uh, what the VA is doing in that regards from your standpoint as the uh, Women Veterans Program Coordinator. First of all, I'd like to thank you. It's an honor to be here today speaking with um, Veterans Radio and also the guest that's on the line with us, um, Dr. Hayes, and Dr. Hayes, Brian Hayes, <laughs> <laughs> and also... Um, thanks, um, thanks for the promotion, Cheryl. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, General <laughs> Brigadier uh, Fassan. Um, her and I, we go back a long way from years and years ago. And so, so um, over the years, I'm sure as she comes into the VA and has worked throughout the nation with various organizations in the Office of Women's Health that we can see the different things that have happened over the years. And just a quick note to say that this year we're celebrating 100 years of um, the VHA um, caring for women veterans. So I think that's great, and you'll hear about it more and more. The actual nat, um, um, day of celebration will be in September sometime, but we're celebrating it throughout the year, so I know you'll hear more about it as time goes on. So I'd like to point out, too, some of the things that you said. The number of women veterans enrolling in the VA for health care is increasing, and it's also placing new demands on the VHA health care system. More women are choosing the VA health care system than ever before when women account for over 30% of the increase in veterans served over the past five years. Um, women veterans are using the VHA service um, has tripled since 2001 and has grown to over 6,000-plus women today. So you're right, 17.2% of active duty, and 21.1% of the um, guards and reserves. So we continue to see the demand and the increase um, for women. So what the Office of um, Women's um, Health has done um, under the leadership of Dr. Um, Patty Hayes is taking these things under consideration, and really she's been talking about these things for years now since she um, um, was appointed in this position back in 2007, I do believe, is how do we enhance the quality of care to our women? And one of the things that we looked at was improving services for primary care, gynecology, maternity care coordination, um, infertility issues as well as IVF, also funding for what we know as the Women's Health Innovation Staffing Enhancement WISE, as well as training initiatives to train our staff. And then there was also legislation passed, but I can talk about all those things uh, and tap back into them. I don't want to keep rattling on. I want to give you the opportunity um, to um, ask any more questions. Also, I just wanted to point out, at the end of fiscal year um, FY 2020, there were about 833,000 women veterans enrolled, which accounted for 9.5% of veteran enrollees. And by the end of FY 2030, the VA projects over a uh, over 1,121,000 women veterans will be enrolled, which would account for 12.6% um, of the um, veteran enrollees. And Cheryl, those are all great indicators that the um, level of effort that the VA is putting out for women veterans is really increasing. And part of that is just to get the word out, isn't it, that, that women who may not realize they would otherwise qualify for VA health care, they, they kind of have to hear that, hey, we're available, we're here for you, and we have the kind of services that you need. So as part of what's going on, is just a, a, also a communication effort. Yes, that's huge, too. And over the last, um, I guess, maybe almost 10 years now or so, um, I think we came up with the National Call Center for Women Veterans. And so that call center is out there. And the National Call Center allows um, women um, to, if, if they're veterans or even family members as well, that they can actually um call the National Call Center for Women Veterans, and um, they could also go to the um, women's, um, 
um, veterans.gov website and also go there and be connected with the National Call Center information as well. They can do it by text. They can do it by calling. Um, they can also, I think um, we also have a Facebook page now for the National Call Center. And like you said, the biggest thing is communication, right? Letting the veterans know that these services are available to them. A lot of times um, you email through all our veterans, whether male or female, right, that a lot of times they don't think they're a veteran, right? They'll say that, you know, well, I was in the military. You know, now they're out of the military, and they don't see themselves as being veterans. They oftentimes will say, you know, well, a veteran is a person that was in war, and right. that's not true either. So, like you said, it's the communication and getting it out there. And so we do communicate these efforts, and we have ways for them to get a hold of us. And once, if they call the National Call Center, we are tasked as Women Veteran Program Managers to follow up within three days. So there will be a notification sent from the National Call Center to us, then we have three days to follow up with that veteran. We have to act on it immediately and then send them back the disposition. What did we do for that veteran? Did we get the care or what they were asking for? Did they get their question answered or were they um, directed to the right individuals? So that's another um, thing that's um, enforcing how we make sure we take care of our women veterans. Yeah, fo follow-up is everything, and I think that's what frustrates people in big organizations and when there isn't follow-up. So that's a great idea that if you call that national number, and I'm going to ask you here in a minute to, to give us yeah, that national yes, number. I, I don't have it in front of me. You but, in a but if you <laughs> If you call that national number, uh, it's going to go out to your uh, uh, health care system wherever you are in the nation, and they're okay. going to follow up with you. So that's, again, making sure that's all done in a timely fashion is important. Do you happen to have that uh, call number handy? Yes, I do. The national, um, the Women's Veteran Call Center is 855-829-6636. Again, that's 855 855- Eight two nine six six three six, and there there are there are, um, times on Monday through Friday, eight a.m. to ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Saturday, eight a.m. to six thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time, excluding federal holidays. I, I wanted to go back to some of the services uh, that uh, is being provided in these uh, women pr uh, health care programs. Because, you know, these are women issues, but you may not think about it being offered by the VA. Maternity care, childbirth education classes, postpartum support, ultrasounds, mammograms. I mean, these are all stuff that's normal women's health care issues. But again, you may not think that you can get those kind of services at the VA. Uh -huh. And yes, you can. So, um, so, the, the, so let me go over some of the things that we could say. So comprehensive primary care would include acute care, chronic illness, gender-specific care from a single provider. So we do have what we call um, women's health primary care providers. These are designated providers who have um, committed to wanting to be um, designated um, WHPCPs, and they have been trained and continue to get their continuing um, community education trainings that are required by the Office of Women's Health that um, they do so many um, CMEs uh, every two years to make sure that they're proficient in this um, area and also training initiatives that have been done for one to just um, to highlight this, the VA has established a women's health mini residency program, and that happened back in 2008, to improve VA clinician skills and knowledge of women's health topic and mitigate the deficiencies or deficient um, in women's, um, provide, women's health providers. So since that time, we have educated about 10,000 um, providers with these mini residencies to date, as well as the um, we, um, the women's the Office of Women's Health teamed up with the Office of Rural Health in partnership in back in 2017, and now they have with the mobile training program, they have trained over 1,000 rural clinicians um, to help women in those rural areas. So we do do. Like, as you mentioned, routine gynecological care, also mental health, um, disease management, prevention, and screening. We also offer emergency care, infertility care, 
um, maternity care, including lactation support and supplies, um, newborn care up to seven days, but there is some legislation that's going into play that we're trying to extend, um, getting more than seven days for newborn coverage, um, specialty care, hospice, um, palliative care, and long-term care services and support. So before I let, and normally I get to just, Dale doesn't let me do these benefit shows because he knows I just like to do all the talking, but I, I, I'm going to let Brian back in. I'm going to let the, the general back in here momentarily, yes, but I'm talking, to Cheryl, I'm talking to Cheryl Allen, who's Women's Veterans Program Coordinator, and you mentioned something that I think is really important about the the research and the training that VA is doing mm-hmm. because it has a fantastic program uh, for, you know, 100 years of training and research, but it's been primarily focused on men. So is the, is the might of the VA now getting focused on um, uh, research and training for women? And I think you're telling me it is. Yes, it is. I, I 100% agree, agree with you. And like I said, under the leadership of um, Dr. Patty Hayes, since 2007 up until this point in time, we have definitely come a long ways. I think we can see that when we come in the VA with the new changes. We can see that in training. And this is not just for providers, but it's for all staff, um, with nursing staff as well, uh, and, 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 and anyone, the clerks, the MSAs, you know, it's an expectation. So a lot of times the women's veteran program managers will get, you know, educational trainings and different things to um, that will come to us, and we immediately send that out as like an announcement, and then Brian Hayes will get back in here, and he will say that all the initiatives and different things that have come out, he supports that, and his whole team, the Public Affairs Office, supports that as well. So we continue to see, you know, the increase of education among staff, as well as, like you're saying, in research. Also, you know, when, when I get an opportunity, so I won't dominate this call, just to talk a little bit about the wise enhancement funds that we receive and what we've been able to do with that money locally. So I'm going to stop talking right now and let somebody else jump in. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Brigadier General Carol Ann Poisson retired, a nurse and a woman who uses the VA healthcare system. I don't know if you've got statements to make or questions to ask, but I'll turn the microphone over to you. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much for being on. And, you know, um, as you've indicated, the services are phenomenal, and it is geared to a woman. It makes you feel like you're not one of the boys, and going to a special, beautiful area, I think the environment is also very special. But one thing that you talked about that I love is every VA isn't the same, and to all of our listeners We should be really proud that we're in this area, Um, the Ann Arbor VA Medical Center, um, Charles S. Kettles, is probably, in my mind, one of the best in the country. And I really loved what you talked about, Cheryl, the follow-up and the responsibility that if somebody calls, a woman calls the number, the hotline, that they must get response within three days. Um, I, I can't tell you how that issue of accountability is so important to get somebody the answers to their questions. Brian, I know you're not speaking for all of Ann Arbor VA or, I mean, or all of the VA in general, but I, I think I think it's important for folks to realize that these are national programs. These are being rolled out at all the centers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, no, there's not much more to say than what you said, um, Jim. The, 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 the women's health program is a national VA program. It's not just an Ann Arbor VA program. It's a massive rollout, uh, reaching out to women veterans to let them know that they're welcome. We're providing welcome and safe spaces for women to come and receive their health care. And it's happening all over the VA everywhere. Yeah, and and that research and training, the same thing. I mean, this is a national research. Mm-hmm. I mean, the VA is a juggernaut in research. So, again, putting their uh, research dollars and, and might into research and training, to me, is a big deal for women's health. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You got to get the you know properly trained folks in there to provide the care. 
And, you know, that's number one. And then there are opportunities to do lots of research so we can learn how to do things better. You know, we're always trying to improve every day. That's one of our missions. Just get better and, and every sure, day. And Cheryl, let me ask, uh, as the center's now been opened uh, a little bit, are you seeing, uh, I, I know you're also, there's a lot of quality work that gets done. And are you seeing more satisfaction? Are you seeing uh, women veterans uh, have sort of the reaction that uh, Carol Ann does? That, Man, this was nice to go into this space. So are we talking about our new women's health clinic that we just opened in February? And um, that space is um, definitely a um, blessing, and that space is great because when you come into that area now, the women have a, a, a space to call their own, right? And more and more VAs are across the country are moving towards, you know, trying to have separate space. Um, for our women veterans, as we continue to talk about the increase in numbers that we're seeing coming in and utilizing um, the care. So, yes, it's very um, beautiful. Um, it is a private space. Um, and, you know, we're just like you said, as I, um, one nurse says, we're still getting our sea legs. So we're getting everything put together. But, yes, we have had positive response. Um, having that space there and that area there. And if you have the opportunity to come over in the future, I would love to have you there to show you the facility and um, what um, our team has done in our hospital and under the leadership of Dr. Jenny Kreisman, um, what we've been able to do for our women's veterans. Um, I think the other thing is, is that we know as the numbers continue to increase, and I'm a firm believer if you build it, they will come. I think that we'll grow out of this space really quickly because, you know, once you um, present things to individuals, as we can see with some of our numbers right now, even with the Canton VA, the new opening of the Canton VA, I can guarantee you, I truly believe that within another year, we're going to say, wow, look, we're really growing and, and steadily growing because it's not just a subspecialty um, clinic area. This is a Monday through Friday area where it's um, 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 incorporated with you know, so especially gynecological care as well as primary care. So we're talking about that, you know, comprehensive care for women. So we have other providers, female providers, also working in that space. So it's, it's a really um, great thing that um, we have finally gotten, and this is what the um, women veterans have been asking for, is to have a space that they can call their own, and now they have that space. Well, it, it, and this doesn't happen uh, overnight, as we all know. It takes a, it takes Congress to make the money available. It takes a lot of planning and, and efforts by folks and from national organizations uh, promoting women's health all the way down. So this is really a, a large community effort nationally, and it's great to see the money's been uh, made available and put to such good use. But you've wet our, uh, our our interest here with reference to the Wise Enhancement Funds, which I have yes. no idea where that what that's about, and I don't know okay. where you're taking us. So tell us about it. So I will tell you a little bit about this. This has been really great. Um, so the Wise Health Innovation and Staffing um, Enhancement. Um, so the you know the acronyms are Wise. Um, this was one of the ways to improve. Um, getting more staff or equipment or whatever we needed to improve the care in our women's um, health programs across the nation. So back in um, 2021, the VA launched the Women's Health uh, Innovation and Staffing Enhancement, WISE program. WISE provided an opportunity for sites to apply for funding for women's health personnel or innovation programs to mitigate local gaps in availability of women's health personnel. Uh, personnel. And so WISE has led to over a 1,000 positions to support women's health care across the nation. Locally, we were able to hire a um, PSA, which is a program supportive system for the women's health care um, um, at our system. Um, we were able to hire a um, physical therapist that specializes in pelvic floor therapy, which is awesome. We were able to also bring on a health psychologist for the women's health program. Um, we got protected time for um, on one of our mental health champions. And also recently we um, applied for more funding and we were able to get a um, women's health primary care provider full-time position. And just um, this month we were so blessed and so fortunate 
to um, be able to hire a women's health pharmacist for the program. And we do have funding at this point now for maternity care coordinator full-time because the VA has said that um, one of the things that the VA has full coverage, um, a, a range of maternity care and postpartum service to our veterans, but also because the VA is, VA is expanding the maternity care coordination programs in all the VHA health care systems across the nation, um, they want to ensure that the coordination of care for um, 12 months postpartum delivery is able to be done. So not only will the maternity care coordinator be following pregnant women, but they will be following postpartum deliveries for up to 12 months. So that's the need for that full-time position for um, the maternity care coordinator. And I'm happy to say that we did also receive money for that position. So it's really great, and there's more things to come in the future. We're hoping that there will be um, WISE um, 4.0, that we can ask for more positions as long as it's okay with our local directors and they are um, willing to, you know, um, buy in and see the need where we might need more positions, then we'll move forward for asking for more funding um, for our site. So this well, is Well, this, this is great information about uh, women's health care centers all throughout the VA, not, uh, not just in Ann Arbor, but wonderful to hear what Ann Arbor is being able to do. It's nice to have a sort of side uh, pot of funding money through the WISE program, enhancement funds to to pull in those specialists. And, and as you say, that's been done across the country as well, over a thousand positions created. So uh, excellent all the way around. Hey, Brian, as we come to the bottom here, uh, I sure. wanted to ask you to tell us any other uh, items that are going on with the VA that you think uh, the veteran radio listeners ought to know about. Well, we've got a lot of stuff going on locally. You know, this week uh, we're celebrating uh, Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day. That's on the 29th, and that's going to be from uh, 9.30 until 11 o'clock in the morning at the uh, Kettles VA Medical Center at our Canton CBOC and at our Toledo uh, Clinic as well. I'm trying to get away from that CBOC language. It's kind of inside baseball. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all uh, have to uh, uh, re- yeah. rephrase our language here. I know. We get good at government speak after a while. but uh, So that's there, and that's going to have displays there. Um, we pulled veterans and asked them how they wanted us to do do this and they're like we're really you know everybody's already got a pin can we just have coffee and donuts and hang out and we're like yeah come on let's go <laughs> so that's that's kind of the celebration and uh you know and if there'll be pins available if people need pinned as well uh also just uh, wanted to uh, mention that our the sort of the grand ribbon cutting a ceremony for our women's clinic at the kettles va medical center is coming up on the 13th and that's going to be at 11 o'clock uh right outside the women's clinic so that's happening and uh after two years we're finally able to uh Uh, do a ceremony and a renaming ceremony for our Canton uh, VA clinic. And that's coming up on May 5th. uh, Are you able, I think you are uh, able to tell us how, who it's going to be named uh, for major general Oliver W. Dillard was a Canton resident and a very prominent figure in the army, particularly in the intelligence community. Uh, And so in fact, <clears throat> the uh, the law has already been passed. The clinic so has actually already been named. Uh, we just have to have a ceremony for it. And and uh, you know a lot of lot of pride in the African American community over Major General Dillard. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got quite a quite a story that uh, folks can be proud of. So yep. naming this uh, community clinic. Uh, Formerly known as the CBOC. Uh, yeah, let's yeah. Not say. <laughs> well, honestly, you know, if if anybody, any anyone listening is interested to learn more about um, Major General Dillard, uh, he's got a great wiki page. <laughs> uh, he passed away a few years ago, but uh, his family maintains, and uh, one of his colleagues from the Army, who's actually coming to the ceremony, um, he's uh, he maintains the Wikipedia page for Major General Dillard. So, uh, and I actually, before he passed away, I I got to spend some time. Uh, back when I was in a clinical aspect of, of VA and, uh, he was, he was in, he was an incredible guy and just, you know, as they say, he was cut from a different cloth and he really was. Um, so just, we're just so proud to be able to put his name on that clinic. Well, it's certainly important to, and, and it's a great way to remember local history, uh, by naming these to, just like, uh, Medal of Honor winner Charles Kettles is for, uh, the Ann Arbor VA Medical Center. So mm-hmm. this is a great honor for the, uh, Major General Oliver Dillard's family, but 
but more so for the community at large to realize it's one of their own uh, mm-hmm. who who are getting honored here, and so folks don't lose that lose that history. We're all about that history here on Veterans Radio, as you know. So, um, anything else you want to pass along before? Uh, no, we... I think uh, I think that's pretty much what we had. Uh, Priest, just want to say a thanks again while we're on the air for Cheryl for coming on. She's just the the number one person to talk about the women's clinic and women's health, and does such a great job. Cheryl uh, Allen, uh, the Women's Veterans Program Coordinator, we can hear the passion and the pride in your voice. Thank and you. as we all know, projects like this take a lot of effort, uh, not only to get started, but to get to completion and then continue to maintain excellence as you're going on. And based on your, your pride and passion, I know the excellence will continue. Thank you for joining us here on Veterans Radio. Yeah, and I appreciate you having us. And just a special shout out to, um, like I said, our director, Dr. Jenny um, Creesman, as well as our CMO over the Vision 10, uh, Dr. Anthony Rosticchio, and um, as well as Marisa Trash, who's a special population manager for um, the Women's Health Program. And then just real quick, um, I know we know about the PAC Act, and that also um, is with women, and then also the Service Act that was passed in uh, the Service Act is um, where um, it requires the Department of Veteran Affairs to ensure that any um, veteran who deployed during active military, Navy, or air service to an identified area where they have been exposed to toxic um, um, exposures such as burn pits is eligible for mammography screening by a VA healthcare provider. So the VA will implement the service act for an eligible veteran with a breast cancer risk assessment and a recommendation for a mammogram when clinically um, appropriate. So that's another thing that's coming out. So we know about the PACT Act and then the service act. And then there's another um, bill protecting moms who serve, um, increasing maternity care coordination and additional um, newborn care. So thank you so much for your time today, and we really appreciate you allowing us to be on today with you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Brian, for joining us and updating our veteran radio listeners about some of the interesting things going on with the VA that they may be able to take a, uh, a, a part of or be a part of. We're going to uh, hear a few words from our sponsors and come back and uh, talk some benefit issues. So with that, we'll uh, turn it back to the studio. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Major Bud Day's F-100 was hit by ground fire, destroying his hydraulics and putting the plane into a steep dive. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at one 800 693 4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1 800 693 4800. Day ejected from his damaged plane. He smashed against the plane and broke his arm in three places. North Vietnamese militiamen captured him when he landed. When he refused to answer questions, they staged a mock execution and then hung him from a rafter by his feet for several hours. On his fifth day in camp, he untied himself and escaped. On his second night on the run, a bomb landed near the sleeping day, leaving him bleeding from his ears and sinuses and sent shrapnel into his leg. Between the 12th and 15th day, he heard helicopters and stumbled to the sound. The choppers left just before he got to the landing zone. The next morning, he ran into a North Vietnamese patrol. As he limped toward the jungle, he was shot in the leg and hand and captured soon afterward. He was moved to the Hanoi Hilton. His untreated wounds were infected, and he suffered malnutrition. The fingers on both hands were curled into fists as a result of torture. He regained some motion by peeling them back, flattening them against the wall in his cell, and leaning into them with his full weight. For more than five years, Day resisted the North Vietnamese guards. When guards rushed in to break up a forbidden religious service, Major Day stood up, looked down the muzzles of the guns, and began to sing the Star Spangled Banner. The other men, including Admiral James Stockdale, joined him. They were released on March 14, 1973, and President Ford presented the Medal of Honor to both Day and Stockdale on March 6, 1976. 
The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative. Maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. We can all help someone going through a difficult time. Learn how you can be there for veterans. Visit VeteransCrisisLine.net. VeteransCrisisLine.net. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Well, we're gl- glad to be back. Um, I thought it was a great uh, segment. Um, and it raises a couple of issues. But before I get there, I want to uh, thank Dale Throneberry, my partner, for putting together that Medal of Honor segment. Um, he, he's always been right on top of those matters. And, and this timing couldn't have been better. Yesterday, March 25th, uh, was the nationally recognized Medal of Honor Day, where we should recognize those men uh, who have uh, paid such price for uh, in their sometimes in their life, often with limb, uh, to receive the Medal of Honor. One one receives it, one doesn't earn it uh, or get awarded it because they did X, Y, or Z uh, push-ups. This is this is harrowing stuff when you read uh, or listen to what these uh, these men have done um i direct you to a home of heroes uh site that is maintained in uh, by legal help for veterans home of heroes uh, dot com and, and you'll learn a lot more about different uh really heroic efforts by uh, folks, who, some now about 3,700 who have received the Medal of Honor over time. And Veterans Radio has often spoken to Medal of Honor recipients uh, or historians about uh, their efforts. So there's a lot in our archives at veteransradio.net if you're interested in hearing more stories about those who have received the Medal of Honor. So timing on this couldn't have been better, and I really appreciate the effort put into it. There, there was something, though, uh, Carol Ann uh, Fossone, nurse, uh, retired Brigadier General from the Air Force, that was mentioned last in our last segment about women and, and uh, being involved at the Women's Health Clinic. And, and the, um, the, she gave us a statistic. I'm not sure I captured it right. I think she said 9.5% of enrollees are women. But what we didn't, I didn't back up and ask her, how do you enroll in the VA? How do you, how do you get yourself into where you maybe can get VA healthcare? Can you just, I know we've talked about it a lot, often on, on Veterans Radio, but can you just mention, uh, briefly for those who might be listening and women in particular, why I should enroll even if I don't get healthcare and just sort, sort of that whole thing? Well, the interesting thing is, um, the enrollment process is the same for a woman as a male, but let me walk through it because if, and I would encourage you to go to your local center, whether the VA Medical Center, Detroit, um, in your locale, because these benefits are available to you. And I will say honestly that women tend to take care of themselves last. They take care of their families, their children, and these benefits are available and they have been uniquely prepared to treat women's health. And so, Jim, what they could do very easily is go online and do a 1010 easy, which they will need their DD-214. But I think it's more important to go in and go to um, eligibility, and they will be processed. And if there are any issues at that time for anything regarding eligibility, as Cheryl was mentioning about um, some of the latest um, things that are coming down, but if you were in a war zone, being able to get a mammography, those services are priceless if you could detect something early on. So go in, and if there's any questions, act to, ask to speak to the, the woman's coordinator. And particularly in Ann Arbor, I see Cheryl everywhere, and um, they will... They will come and do personal one-on-one attention. 
So enrollment uh, is sort of filling out some forms and submitting them. And then whether or not you qualify for health care is based on a lot of things, including income, but also if you have disability ratings and that sort of stuff. So there's a little more complexity in actually getting the care, isn't there? Well, there is. But if you have a disability rating, it's like your foot is in the door. You're you're almost automatic um, to be receiving the services in those areas. And if you could recall, Jim, if you're 70, if you're 50 percent or greater with a disability, whether it's heart or um, maternal or a reproductive, then you could get service for everything. So I think it's real important um, to be in tuned into what you're eligible for and to go in and get enrolled, go down to the Women's Center um, and ask some questions and meet some of the individuals. And I'm sure you're going to find out that you're entitled to more benefits than you ever thought you were aware of. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes uh, that initial step's the hard, hardest one. Um, and before we move off this topic, I want to give that National Women's Call Center uh, again that phone number. So if you've grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil and you want to write this down and pass it along to somebody, uh, 855-829-6636. And uh, you said you heard how important it is, how they use it uh, nationally and then locally, and uh, they're required to get back and and uh, reach out back out to you and give a disposition. Again, that was eight five five eight two nine six six three six. So let, I want to move on to another subject, if I might, uh, Carol Ann, and, and it's one that I think uh, over the last month or two you've mentioned on air and said, well, we ought to come back to this. And, and that's about the family caregiver program that is set up with uh, the Veteran Health Administration. Can, can you explain what this is about? I know you talk to a lot of families and, uh, in your day to day efforts and, and trying to help them navigate the VA system. And this is one that's gotten a lot of attention lately. Sure. Um, and I think you just said something very critical. You know, we tend in the disability world at Legal Help for Veterans to deal with the VBA, the benefit side, as one of the towers. Um, the tower that's responsible for this, and it's interesting that we've just talked about women's health, the family caregivers, and the women in most circumstances, I bet you I, I wish I would have had a percentage of the family caregiver that's a female. Um, this program is coming out of VHA, which is the healthcare side. And so here are some particulars and slow me down and ask me some questions as I'm going along. But you must be at least 18 years um, of age and must be either a spouse, a son, a daughter, a parent, um, a stepfather or stepmother, member of an extended family of the veteran. Um, I think it's real important that the veteran must have a disability rating. Now we're jumping to the VBA side, but the veteran must have a disability rating of 70% or higher to be eligible for this family caregivers program. Um, the one factor that I want to say that I had the most success with getting this approved for the eligible caregiver extended family member is if you're, since you've got a 70% or greater um, disability rating, you deal with your health care team at the VA. Go to that, your team, and tell them you want to get into the caregivers program. That referral from your physician and your social worker will be your greatest step into it because they know you so well. They will help you write this up to apply for the caregivers program. Once now, now, again, help me, help me understand if I'm in the caregivers program, does this mean my spouse, my daughter in law, whoever it is who's helping me and living with me, are they compensated? Yes, they will get paid. I'll get to that in a second. Um, because the criteria 
needs, it's, it's pretty stringent. And the reason I brought up, go back to your team and tell them you're going to apply because they know your health care needs. So the personal care services, the care issues is you need everyday personal support, the feeding, the bathing, the dressing. They, you need to be aware and have the safety and the protection in your daily living environment. Um, you know, like if you can't cook and you've got some dementia and the stove is left on. So there are the personal issues that need to be described in the application. The veteran service connected disability must have been caused um, by your active duty or your service to be eligible. And I think this, Jim, is the next biggest point. Cheryl brought it up with the PAC Act again. Um, I think this, for me, will go down as the biggest um, a recognition of service. So in the PAC Act, as, as of October 1st, 2022, the caregiver program is now open to all eligible veterans in any era before it was just really um, segmented um, for a certain era. Yeah, we so, get into we get into these restrictions that Congress puts on the VA where, hey, yes. it's got to be this war during this date to this date. Yes. And it can't be peacetime and it can't yes. be Korea or it can't be whatever. So so and it's really unfair to veterans who right. served for a long time. Uh, so they've now said, hey, all errors, if you qualify for the program, we're going to get you into the care, family caregivers program. Interesting. Yes. That's great. Um, and so then the other reason for going back to your team or calling a VSO or a county counselor or legal help for veterans are there's a special form. The caregivers form is VA form 10 10 CG for caregivers. And Hopefully that is filled out completely so you get the approval right away. So, so let's let's stop here because VA is nothing but loaded with forms. Yes. And you have to use the right form. You can find them all online and don't pay anybody to get the form. They're all yes. online from VA. It's form 10-10CG. And it's always worth pulling the form down and reading the instructions to the form uh, if you're even thinking about the program, because you may say, oh, I am eligible, or now that I read this, I'm not really eligible. So right. it's always good in this first one, because uh, there's one more you're going to mention, is Form 10-10CG. And so the most important thing next, if you're fl- applying for that, is is you must be enrolled. So you asked me the question about women enrollment. So the veteran must be enrolled in the VA, and that's the 10 10- 10 easy or right go right to eligibility at a VA medical center or a clinic and you could get enrolled but you must be enrolled first before you go to the caregivers 10 10 CG um these these then- are always important uh, forms and 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 but it's often we, we all know how stressful it is for caregivers. I don't care yep. military, yep. non-military. Once your parent or loved one has a medical problem, you have to care for them. It's a super stressful time. Yes. Is, is there a phone number, uh, that you can call in and, and talk to somebody about the caregiver program at VA if you're just sort of a dealing with this and maybe a little stressed out about how to even evaluate it? Sure. Um, I have a number for you, but here's the interesting um, issue with this number. If you get denied out of the family caregivers program, you still could apply for the caregiver support service. And so this is the support care number, um, and it's 855-260-3272. Three two seven four, and the reason for this is maybe you don't meet the criteria for the family caregivers program. And within the family caregivers program, Jim, you brought up something: are they compensated? Yes, they are compensated, and you could have up to three caregivers, three identified family members for each veteran, and they will be paid and compensated for their hours of work. Because as we all know, 
this isn't going to make you rich, but it's helping the veteran and somebody might need to work in the family and have a full time job, but yet it could be supported by this program for somebody else to supplement time because you need more than one caregiver. So if I don't qualify for the family caregivers, explain to me what the caregiver support service program benefit might be. Well, the general is there is another caregivers program. Let's say you don't have a relative, a blood relative, but you have a great friend who lives down the street who might be a nurse. And um, so right away, that individual, they don't meet all of the criteria as set up, but however, he or she might qualify under the general um caregiver support service program. That's the best example I could give. No, that's helpful. And again, what was that uh, call in support number? Sure. It's 855-260-3274. I want to, as the clock winds down, I want to uh, talk about another issue that's a uh, healthcare related benefit of, that veterans find themselves embroiled in uh, dealing with ambulances, uh, private ambulances. Uh, there, there's some recent legislation we can talk about, but but you, you've bumped into this problem over the decade or more that you've been doing this. Talk a little bit about what a veteran or what a veteran's spouse or caregiver should do if they have to call a private ambulance. Well, once again, Jim, I I think the critical questions I ask and I try to address, and I just had one that was first time ever, um, the VBA ordered up a a service, um, a common pen exam, and the veteran got a bill for it. Well, they called us at Legal Help for Veterans. We were able to make a few phone calls. And guess what? The bill's gone. So I would say in this issue, if the veteran, and if that would have been a great one for Brian, um, and we've heard before, um, if the veteran is enrolled, whether it's in Ann Arbor or Detroit or whatever your center is, and you are eligible, go back in, call in and ask why are you getting this private bill? Because it should have been picked up if it's an emergency. And there's always steps called community, um, the community network. Um, but yes, don't, don't pay this bill because once you start to pay one bill, you might be paying other bills. Well, what, what I found interesting this week, uh, in a, in a piece that I read is that the VA covers, uh, transportation to non VA hospitals only if the treatment is authorized by the VA. Well, you get into all these situations where it's sort of an emergency. You can't call ahead. I didn't know I was having a heart attack. Right. Uh, but I've often heard you tell folks, as soon as you get in there, talk to the hospital social worker and make sure that they they contact uh, the VA. Uh, and, and I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm watching my clock here, uh, trying to at least. And, and one of the things I found fascinating is that the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs spent $65 million in 2014, so that, you know, almost 10 years ago, on non-VA transportation services. So they spend a lot of money on non-trans, non-VA transportation services, and that's really prompted a, um, a, a, a congressional representative out of Missouri to file a bill that would allow the, the VA to reimburse veterans when they need emergency transportation to treatment facilities outside the VA network. This is one of those things that just makes so much darn sense, but it'll take uh, way too long to get to Congress. If you get a chance, bug your congressperson to uh, be, be supportive of this kind of effort where – you know, a lot of veterans uh, have to have uh, non V, you know, ambulance transportation to non VA hospitals. So uh, this makes makes a lot of sense. We're coming down to the final few minutes here, and uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we run out of time, and that is we're going to do an interview with a Dr. Patel and uh, and an Army veteran, Mark Aldrich, about uh, VA's acupuncture program. It's really interesting. You'll find it at VeteransRadio.net up on our podcast. But if you're wondering nationwide, hey, what, what's acupuncture about? Or does my, maybe that'll help me with my pain issues. 
fascinating work that the VA is doing in that area. Again, a lot of might, a lot of uh, power comes when VA gets behind a program, and they're now getting behind something called battlefield acupuncture uh, and traditional acupuncture. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm Jim Fossone. If you're not used to this voice, uh, I'm the officer of the deck today because my partner, Dale Throneberry, uh, who's hanging in there, is uh, at sick bay with a bad throat and uh, asks that I jump in. Uh, this is Veteran Radio's 20th year on the air, and, and Dale and his original partners get all the credit for that. We're, we're looking at, it looks like the 1000th program for Veterans Radio will come up July 1st. So that's really exciting. And we want to, as always, thank our uh, VSO sponsors uh, that we have. Um, and you can always support Veterans Radio online and uh, go to veteransradio.net and support us as a sponsor. Send us a little money to keep us going for the next 20 years. We post podcasts every week, uh, which you can find by going to veteransradio.net. Dale, has your voice recovered enough to squeak in and give the uh, dismissal here, or how you doing? <laughs> well, let's see what it sounds like, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you get 76 years old and you get a strep throat. Um, I thought it was a kid's disease. Yeah. Anyway... Um, I want to thank you, Jim, for covering for me. Carol Ann, of course, again, a great program on benefits. Uh, hopefully, everybody who's listening in found this very helpful. I think it's, uh, it's, it's an important part of our mission to get this information out to everybody. And uh, so, again, I want to thank both of you for doing that. And thanks, of course, to Brian and Cheryl for, you know, when we bring in these extra voices, these experts that come in and, and let us know what's happening in the VA system. Is, it's it's it makes you feel good. I mean, it makes me always feel good to know that the VA is actually responding to what are, you know, what we need. You know, and, and the idea that it doesn't make any difference what era of veteran you are now, you, you're covered by these things. So I think that is cool. And he's coming up on 10 seconds here, I can tell. So uh, until next week, this is Dale Thromery for all of us here at Veterans Radio. You are dismissed. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.